My name is Kenneth Palmer uh, from New Jersey, and my rank was E3. One of the fellows came in and said, we're putting a band together when we get in country. Do you want to try it out? I said, sure. I always carried, I had a guitar with me, that was my dad's at the time. I recently written a song about that. And um, so I sat down on my rack and a couple of guys gathered around and I started banging out some tunes. I don't know what I sang. And I don't know how long I even played. And then all of a sudden he just looked over at me and said, you're in. When we get in country, we'll form up, we'll get the equipment from special services. Captain Jack, Commander Mojo, was on his way over. He said he was going to stop in Japan and pick up some equipment. We had no idea what to expect. So we arrived in country and we got all assigned to our jobs. And I was working in this, I was a mechanic working in the light shop, Jeeps and trucks and stuff like that. And one of the guys came over one day after work and said, the stuff's here, meet us at the B Company shops. B Company shops were where all electrical equipment came in. So we went down to the electrical shops and Stuff was still in boxes, so we started breaking this stuff out. And it's the same stuff that these bands are using in the States, like the Beatles. We're talking their guitars, Ludwig drums, Gibson uh, Fender Stratocaster, Gibson Les Pauls, uh, Fender amplifiers, uh, I mean, top of the line equipment. So we didn't even have all the plugs, so the electricians down here made us a bunch of plugs. We plugged everything in and we didn't even have tuning cork forks or anything, so we just kind of found each other's place, and we started, you know, we tuned up and found each other's kind of, we're all in the same key, and then we started figuring out who knew what song or who knew the words to something, so we all figured out a song that we could all kind of play together, so we started playing a song together. The name of the band was Wasted Blood. And then one led to another and led to another, and I don't know how long this went, but I realized, hey, this is fun. So I just, I just cut loose. I mean, who knows how long it's going to last. This is what I want to do. I've always wanted to play in a band, always wanted to play music. And we just, I don't know how long we played. And it was a real, I remember it was a real rainy, drizzly day. Like we had lots of during the monsoon season over there, mud every place. And people started drifting in. You know, you're in a war zone, you hear music, you hear band playing, and people start drifting in. There was quite a crowd in there. It was a big building. There was quite a crowd in there. Sometime during our first try out there, and that's all it was. We were just trying this equipment out. We weren't really formed into a band because the equipment was strictly for special services. Anybody could come in and check it out. You know, if they wanted to play a guitar or bang on the drums or whatever, that's what it was for. This army sergeant comes in from a camp down the road, and he comes up to me, because I was singing, making the most noise, and he says, hey, you guys want to play in our club? I says, what? He says, yeah, you want to put your band, play in our club? I said, we're not a band, we're just trying this stuff out. He says, shh, don't say anything, just come on down, drink some free beer, play some music. I says, well, it's not up to me, you know, I'm E3 here, uh, but they talked, everybody talked it over, and they said if they could put it together, we'd do it. I guess it was a day or a couple later, and we went down to their club and drank free beer. I've got pictures, played, played some music, and the man who put us together, I have tapes of him, recordings of him, had played with Johnny Cash, and he sounds like Johnny Cash. I have pictures of him. And uh, after that, it just kind of exploded. I mean, they just wanted us to play every place. We could have played seven days a week. The next thing I remember, is the doctors and nurses at China Beach heard about us across the bay. But we were new there. We didn't know our ways around. So I said, well, we'll send the chopper over for you and pick you up. But well, we had so much equipment, the chopper could barely get airborne. But if he got forward motion, he could get airlift and get flying. So he got forward motion, we got airlift, we got flying, and we're sitting in there. And we're looking out the window, and we see these little pink sparks flying around outside never dawned on us. We didn't find out till later. We were catching fire as we left camp from the ville right outside our camp. That was my first ex experience with getting shot at. Yeah, made me think a little bit, but this is what we're in war for. This is what we're over there for. So we played that job. We played at China Beach a lot of times. After that, we played a lot of places. We were sent to some places that USO shows couldn't go because they were 
too dangerous. Um, we played downtown for the donut dollies. We coming back from the donut dollies one night. Uh, there were Red Cross girls, and I always had a tendency to motion sickness, so I was squatting on my heels, looking between the shotgun rider and the driver. Oh, maybe 150 yards in front of a truck. I really don't know at this point. The first round hit the road. A big, huge explosion. The very next round was maybe 50 or 60 yards to our right landing in the river. If it wasn't for that, it probably would have got us. Everybody in the truck is yelling, stop. And I'm saying in my head, this is ambush. They want to nail us. I'm saying, get this truck. And I'm, I'm the lowest rated guy in there. Everybody else is third class, second class, and above. And I'm just yelling, get this truck out of here. And the driver just put the pedal to the metal. Now we got rounds falling all over the place. When the second round hit through the canvas, I could see the flash. That's how close it was. Now we're going down the road. The radio operators on the radio try to contact somebody who speaks Vietnamese because the Vietnamese Arvins are in charge of the bridge. We don't speak Vietnamese. Now they got rockets or whatever it was falling on the bridge. Everybody's on the lines with their weapons pointed out, locked and loaded, and we're coming up the road. Now we don't want them to shoot at us. <laughs> Finally, somebody on the other end of the radio contacted somebody who spoke Vietnamese who contacted the people on the bridge. They opened the gate. We went in the front door. We went out the back door. We went all the way back to Red Beach. We got back to Red Beach as we were checking our equipment back in, turning the truck back in. We looked at the air back towards where we came from, and the air was just lit with flares. The next night, Snoopy went down there, and he was just dusting the place. And you could just see that red arc just going back and forth. Snoopy's uh, Gatling guns from a, from a fixed-wing aircraft uh, fired out. I don't know exactly how they fire out the doors. And it's a minigun, and it's firing, I forget how many thousand rounds a minute. You could just see that red snake just come. It's the only time I ever saw that thing work. And you could hear it from that many miles away, just kind of sound going through the air. Then we went, uh, we were called down. We played for all our detachments, all of our CB detachments. When we sent guys out, we went down to LZ Baldy at one point. And I didn't realize how dangerous LZ Baldy was until a couple of years ago when I read the book about Carlos Hathcock, who was the Marines Corps' number one sniper of all time, 93 confirmed kills. He was working out of this place, or right about that time. I think it was right around then when he hit the mine and got severely injured, but I know it was right at the same time. We played down there, and we played lots of very loud music. The night before we played there, they got hit and almost got overrun. It was Charlie in the wire, a friend of mine who was laying in his rack when the first round hit. <clears throat> told me he was laying on his rack, actually was our first drummer, told me he never even heard the explosion. He was laying there on Sunday afternoon listening to the radio and the next thing he knew was the radio was laying in the middle of his chest with a hole smoking through it. And the thing that saved his life was they always stacked the sandbags up four feet or so on the outside of the hooches. It hit on the outside, but the radio was above the stacked sandbags. And that's when they got hit real wow. hard. It was Saturday, actually that was Saturday afternoon. Sunday afternoon is when we played there. So that's one of the places that we played at. We pretty hairy stuff, you know, playing music. Um, then one of the other place we played was we went over to the Sky Crane. There's these huge, super big, huge prop helicopters that carried everything. They, they could carry connect boxes, mortar towers, and they had recently lost a crew. That's where that sergeant that originally hired us or asked us to come and play, that's where he had his crew working over and played over there for those guys. And then the word got out, and then they flew us all the way up to the DMZ to play for, I think it was MCB-10, and the, I don't know if it was the Army, I thought Screaming Eagles were up there. So we played up there for them. But we couldn't leave, because every aircraft coming and going was getting shot up. So we stayed there for a couple of days and played. And I wish I could find it. It was supposed to be entered into my permanent records. A, a commendation from the com commander of that unit sent to our commanding officer complimenting us on our professionalism. Good job of a show that we did. It was just such a phenomenal experience to go over there and be an entertainer during the war.
the big thing was is that you had r and R's. I mean, uh, you had the USO shows coming in from all, all different countries. But the thing that made them, I feel, love us above and beyond was the fact that we were Americans playing American music, wearing the same uniform that they were, catching all the same crap that they were every single day of the week. Now we were doing this on our old time. We were doing 10 and a half hour, 10, 10 days, 10 hour days, six and a half days a week, and practicing after work, doing all these jobs after work, and then coming back and still doing a 10 hour day every single day. And then we'd also play in our own club. And then we also went across the street and played for the Marines. And we went down to Dog Patch, uh, which was another one of our, det our detachments. Uh, it's really hard to remember every place that we played, but to be a musician, I mean, it was just so, such a lucky deal. And <clears throat> I just have a flair for it. I, love, I brought a guitar with me today. I never, you never know. I mean, I traveled with a guitar the whole time I was in the Navy. And to not travel with one when I'm coming to see these guys, is, even though I don't play, I practice in my room. It's just the way I always did it. And it's the way I always will do it. I'd love to play.